All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is David Godwin, and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange Program with the University of Florida. Today, I'm excited about our presentation by Dr. Louise Loudermilk, research ecologist and fire team lead for the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station. Before we move on, I'd like to take just a quick moment to share a little bit of information about the Southern Fire Exchange. SFE is a regional program for fire science delivery in the Southeast. We're a collaborative among the University of Florida, Tall Timbers Research Station, North Carolina State University, and the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station. We're sponsored by the federally funded Joint Fire Science Program, and we are the Southeastern branch of the Nationwide Fire Science Exchange Network. Working with our network of partners, we develop programs and opportunities and events that work to bridge the divide between the fire science and natural resource management communities. We have over 70 of our past fire science and management webinars, just like this one, that have been recorded and posted to our YouTube webinar archive. So these are great resources for uh, professional development, for your own interests. If you put together RT-130 fire refresher courses uh, and online classes. So if you check out our uh, YouTube channel. I'll put a link to it in the chat window in just a moment, and, uh, and you can find some of our previous webinars. And finally, if you're joining us today from an area outside of the southeastern U.S., welcome. Uh, but please look also into connecting with your local fire science exchange network. These are the folks that are working to connect regional managers and researchers to address local fire science issues and make differences on the ground. You can go to firescience.gov uh, for more information to pull up a map like that one and to click on the map and connect with the exchange in your neck of the woods. So finally, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Louise Loudermilk is the new fire team lead of the Center for Forest Health and Disturbance within the Southern Research Station in Athens, Georgia, the US Forest Service. She has over 15 years of experience in fire ecology with specialized experience in longleaf pine, landscape ecology, and fuels characterization using LIDAR. The work she pre presents today illustrates her goal to provide insight into how on the ground management today benefits landscape scale projections of ecosystem stability into the future. So welcome, Louise. I'm really excited to have you with us today. Thanks everybody for joining us on the line. And just one moment, please, as we trade out presentations. Thanks, David, for that great introduction. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say that, of course, everybody's dealing with something similar where they have kids and dogs at home and I have two of each. <laughs> so um, I told the kids they weren't allowed to come in unless they were bleeding or the house was on fire. So. <laughs> We shall see what happens. Uh, but anyways, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, yeah, this project um, is associated with a joint fire science um, uh, project that we had for several years. Um, and we actually did a similar study that you see today um, for three different, what they call CFLRP landscapes. Collab uh, collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program. And the other two were in um, Oregon, the Malahira National Forest, and the other one was in the Dinky Landscape, uh, which is in California in the Sierra Nevada. Um, and so if you're interested in those studies, they're, they're all published, I can provide those to you. Uh, but today we're gonna focus on the Osceola National Forest. Um, and the, my co-PIs on this are Matt Herto from the University of New Mexico and Rob Scheller from North Carolina State University. Um, and Dan Kropchek at the time was a postdoc and he did most of the legwork on this. Um, he did all the model parameterization and, um, and most of the graphs and everything you see today was uh, most of Dan's doing. And so he is now at Sandia National Lab 
Uh, but, uh, and then there's of course always like so many people involved, which we'll talk about as we sort of move forward here. So the first thing I just wanna do is introduce you to, um, to the, the new Athens Fire Lab. Uh, this is a recently built facility uh, this is in. Um, this is just a couple steps away from my office, uh, and it's a new facility where we can uh, do fire, fuel, wind, smoke experiments, um, all in sort of a really safe and um, controlled environment. And um, and this is mainly led by. Um, we all work in this fire lab, um, but it's mainly led by our project leader, new project leader, uh, Dr. Joe O'Brien. And um, you know we've just started some experiments, um, and they're definitely going to range in scale. These are some of the smaller ones where we're looking at, um, you know, measuring uh, smoke outputs in particular matter, as well as sort of vegetative um, vegetative heat transfer um, from fire. So, and if anybody's interested, they're welcome to uh, to come, and we, you know we can give you a tour. I mean, I know there's some. COVID issues right now, but um, uh, what's nice about this is like we can open the doors and um, and um, it's, you know, you feel a little safe with the social distancing. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to give some, you know, a uh, little self citing here on uh, our new Athens Fire Lab. We're very, very excited about it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my video just because, just because I can. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I can. Oh my gosh, maybe I can. Maybe I'm stuck like this. Okay. Oh, my can you still hear me? I hope yes, so. We can, so still, we can still hear you. Awesome. I'm going to keep going just like you still hear me. Okay. So, okay. So, let's talk about the project. Okay. So, just thinking about um, what's happening in the United States and um, what's also happening in the Southeast in particular. There's this increasing frequency of climate extremes. And uh, what's interesting here is this is a really interesting paper that came out in PNAS in uh, 2015. Well, these show these percent change in both drought and heat waves. And this is not even projected climate. This is what's been happening in the last couple of decades. And so you see as much as 100% change in drought and heat waves. Um, particularly in the Southeast. And what, what's also interesting about the Southeast is when we're looking at projections in the Southeast, there's increases in temperature and precipitation, even though the precipitation is much more variable throughout the year or, um, or even across the different region, regions in the Southeast. Increase in soil moisture deficit, and there's some interesting work on looking at range expansion and dry ecosystems. So even though you know we know that climate change is going to have an effect on a plant physiology, uh, specifically looking at sort of soil moisture um, and temperature, uh, but and those are considered kind of these like push disturbances. It kind of slowly happens. Um, there's also pulse disturbances, which is more associated with fire. Um, and there's, of course, other pulse disturbances like hurricanes and, and harvest and things like that. But they have the sort of most, the sort of strongest impact on ecosystem state and composition and change over time. And so that's what we're going to focus on here. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, climate impacts on fire weather. So this is an interesting uh, book chapter, actually, that uh, and I just grabbed a couple graphs out of it. And this shows you the change in KBDI uh, averages over the southern US. And, and so here, so the black line is uh, KBDI values for about 2010 and in 2060, not too far from now, guys. Um, huge changes in KBDI, and it also sort of shifts, and, it, and it's particularly true in like summer, you know, fall and into sort of early winter months. And another interesting graph that I found was, uh, this is their current, uh, which is in the sort of dotted lines and predicted uh, values of um, increasing fire season length. 
And particularly if you look at those bottom two lines, that's about where this, this study is in the Gulf Coast, Gulf Coast Middle South. Um, and we're looking at an additional you know, two to three months of fire season length. So here we're particularly thinking about wildfires, right? So just to give a little, a little bit of context of why we're interested in this, um, in particularly looking at fire weather. Now, uh, this is a, a great graphic that was published by Matt Hertow um, in 2008. And this really gives you a, a good visual on, and most of us kind of see this, um, but um, it's our management influence on fire. So if we're able to, uh, this, this originated, this is a Western based um, uh, image, but it still has implications here. But uh, we see, so this, the bottom part of the figure uh, gives us a representation of if we apply prescribed fire, we apply some sort of thinning and active management, then if fires do come through, then they're gonna be less, you know, less intense than a wildfire. And if we think about it from a carbon perspective, um, on the left there, you would see that um, if there was a dense forest um, and there was a lot of fuel buildup, then, it's, then it, you have potentially more um, carbon release that might occur on the landscape and less carbon storage, which is in that little cube there. And, but on the right, if you have a more managed forest and if um, then you're actually storing sort of more carbon through time because less is being released into the atmosphere. And so thinking about this together, you know, active management can really have the ability to influence effects on climate change through active fire management. And so as we would see here. And so when we're thinking about, um, you know, applying active management, it's like, yeah, it's great and all for me to say that, right? <laughs> but, but it comes down to like, it's really a challenge to have active fire management. And like, even if we're thinking about it, just like planning for it, having the resources, people, money, um, time. Um, and we're often managing really, really large landscapes. And we have a lot of like different types of valued resources across those landscapes, whether it's diversity or, you know, ENT species, um, timber production, or, you know, various ecosystem services. So, and understanding this effectiveness requires us to understand not just how, but how much management can modify the influence of different types of disturbance events that are related to climate. And to make it even more complicated, you know, how do we examine this efficacy in juxtaposed ecosystems? And so that's basically, it's just ecosystems of two very different ecosystem types. So an example of that is, um, this is actually an image from Big Cypress National Wildlife Refuge in South Florida. Um, and, but you can see the sort of mosaic of pinelands and wetlands like across the area. And that's, it's pretty common across the Southeast to have these very, very different ecosystems that are adjacent to each other. So this is, um, uh, an image of the uh, pine flatwoods, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Um, this is from the Osceola National Forest. And in this system, uh, you know, it's mainly dominated by longleaf pine. You have a mix of slash and loblolly pine, understory of saw palmetto and gallberry and various wire grasses. And the flatwoods are an interesting system because they're, they're, they're typically a little more mesic. They're extremely productive high rates of biodiversity in the understory and endemic species, um, high growth rates, and therefore you actually have pretty high fuel accumulation. You can burn as often as every year. Um, so it's a frequent surface fire regime. And if you can, and you could have literally this fine line, you can literally draw a line right here between these two different ecosystems. So you can have the pine flatwoods that are directly lined up against more of a wetland area. 
And, um, and these wetlands, I mean, almost couldn't be any different <laughs> than the pinelands. So you have a pretty um, diverse upper story, typically pond cypress, bald cypress, sweet gums, black gums, uh, lobolly bays, um, and um, but you know this, uh, this ecosystem is also high in diversity. It creates unique ecotones, um, you know, between the wetlands and the pinelands. But you know they burn much less frequently. You know, um, some say they don't burn at all that often. Um, it's typically a pretty high water table, um, but they have variable hydro periods. Uh, they typically have high fuel moisture characteristics and very different litter traits, and that can really have an impact on ignition potential and ultimately fire frequency. But when they do burn, they burn, um, and when there's a drought, and when they do burn, it can be really, really intense fires. So as you can imagine, you know, um, you know, having these adjacent to frequently burned pinelands presents a, a real challenge because it sort of, you know, restricts the burn window to milder weather conditions. It's dependent on water levels. Um, and that can, you know, vary throughout the year. And so, you know, this is an example of, you know, what can happen um, if there's, you know, large amounts of drought a uh, very low water table, and we can have really immense wildfires in these, um, these wetlands. So this is a bugaboo fire, which actually transitioned into the Georgia Bay, Georgia, Florida Bay complex fire. Um, it burned almost 500,000 acres. And this is becoming more and more common um, with some other ones that you might recognize. This is the West Mims fire, the Honey Prairie fire, the Impassable Bay fire. Um, and these mosaic landscapes of pinelands and wetlands have been found to produce the most extreme fire behavior potential in the eastern United States. And so here, I just thought I would put these two pictures together. So, um, so the picture on the right is actually a picture I took last year when we burned um, at the Osceola in the experimental plots, uh, which we'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and um, but you can see here the extreme differences in sort of fire intensity that you see in these two different ecosystems. And what's also important is um, is within these wetlands, if it is really dry for a long period of time, um, and there's been a, a strong development of the sort of organic soil layer or what they consider the duff layer or peat, uh, depending on sort of the ecosystem type. But so there's, so the, the thing here is that there's highly variable organic layer depth, centimeters to meters, highly variable consumption by fire, and it's dependent on the current water content, um, drought conditions, fire weather conditions. And as such, when it does burn, there's highly variable carbon lost from smoldering combustion. And just kind of going through the literature and asking some of my local experts on soil, um, you know, I found literature values from anywhere from 20 to 90% carbon lost, totally, that's total carbon that's available um, in, that, in that system. So it can be a really enormous amount of carbon that's lost. Um, so getting into the project, our study objectives are to determine how fire weather conditions affect the stability of landscape forest carbon stocks within the Osceola National Forest and examine the mitigating effects of management to stabilize the forest carbon stocks through time by reducing fire spread and severity. And then also we're going to look at if we add, we know that there's a valuable timber in the area and they do timber harvesting. If we add this additional low volume harvest, you know, how does it affect carbon stability? So here is the Osceola National Forest sort of broken down into a lovely raster layer there for you. <laughs> um, and, and the area is, to, to talk a little bit about the Osceola itself, you know, it's, it's got a history of 
at least 40 years, I would say probably even longer than that, of prescribed burning. Um, several decades of, of timber harvesting. Again, they're a part of the CFLRP. Uh, and, and they have been, I will say, they have been extremely instrumental um, over the years. Uh, they, they were extremely gracious when we came there and talked to them. I hope, hope you're listening to us today. <laughs> Um, and gave us all kinds of, of, of input and insight on how they manage the land and, um, and also inputs for the modeling that we're doing, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And I also want to bring up that we've had these long-term monitoring plots that have been there since I think the 1950s. And, and they're, they're near the Alusti Experimental Forest, which is in the southern part um, of the Osceola. And there are, um, and these, these small little plots are burned on a rotation of one, two, and four years. And then there's a control plot, which is no burning at all. Um, and, and they have been really great about working with us on trying to maintain that burn rotation for, for many decades. And so we're actually starting to get back in there. We were there last year doing experiments. Um, in these different areas. So anyways, I just a big shout out to the folks at Osceola. Um, oh, and so, so also here you can see sort of the mosaic of um, the distribution of the hardwood cypress swamps, which are in black, a little bit more concentrated towards, towards the north. And then we have the pine flatwoods, which are in gray and um, a little bit more concentrated towards the south, but still pretty mixed across the landscape. Okay, so we use the, the Landis 2 simulation model. It's a freely available model. They can go to that website and check it out. It's got all kinds of documentation on how it's run and, um, and how to download everything and how to do it. It's got tutorials for everything. And Landis stands for Landscape Disturbance and Succession. So it is a spatially interactive uh, landscape where the, the area is broken down into cells and those cells can um, have species that, uh, that grow and die and regenerate and they compete against each other in like a light environment and based on soil moisture characteristics and various disturbances. And then what you can do is you can implement these different like disturbance or different extensions that, um, that are relevant toward to your landscape. So for us, even though you can implement such things as insects or, or wind disturbance like wind throw, we focused on wildfires, prescribed fire and, and harvesting. Okay, so within this model, we had um, different model scenarios. So that's the really great thing about using a model like this is like, you don't have to do manipulations on the landscape. You can say, okay, well, if I put all the information that's relevant for the system and start like, I can start creating these different scenarios to, to test how the landscape is gonna respond. And so first we did, um, we did two fire weather scenarios uh, one is using the past 15 years of data. And then we just pulled out the 90th percentile of fire weather, which we consider the extreme fire weather scenario. And we use that together with, um, with implementing no management. So we're not gonna do anything across the landscape. So we know it's never gonna happen, <laughs> but it's an interesting, it's sort of like a control, right? And then we have a, a targeted management, which means we're gonna initiate certain areas with, with targeted thinning, um, and then we do continuous prescribed fire across, across just the pinelands. Um, and, then, and then another scenario, so this is where we're going into if we were implementing a harvesting regime along with the prescribed fire, um, then that would be our third management scenario. And so here, what happens is, you know, the contemporary fire weather data is one of these three different management scenarios. And the same thing happens with the extreme fire weather. 
All right, so this, I just wanted to show this because sometimes people like to see the details on, you know, how some of this data was input. You know, this goes back to really working, um, you know, with the people at Osceola and getting some really interesting fire history data. So we were to use this to parameterize our fire size and frequency. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Okay. So, okay, so for some outputs. All right, so some results. Um, yeah, and if you have any more questions, by the way, about all the stuff that we did here, there's a lot of details in the paper, um, which I believe I cited right, oh my gosh. Here we go, now I'm having fun. Okay, I did cite it right there, okay. So there's a link and I'm sure David already provided it or he's going to. Um, but so, so most of these graphs are in that paper and there's a lot of details in there on how everything was kind of put together. So this first output, we're just going to look at severity. So this is specifically looking at wildfire severity. Management was found to uh, reduce landscape fire severity. And in the first sort of column there, the A, C, and E is just the contemporary fire weather. And this is run over, by the way, this is run over 100 years. Um, and on the right is the extreme fire weather scenarios. As you can see, with no management, you're going to get quite a bit of wildfire severity. And, um, and management has a huge impact and actually has more of an impact uh, for the extreme fire weather. Um, and the, and both what's, what was really interesting though is that the targeted and the targeted with harvest scenarios both reduce wildfire severity by about 20%. And the largest effect was really in the management. Um, the largest effect of management was really in the pinelands. So to look a little bit more at, at the severity. So this is, I think, um, this is really interesting. So the management effects were greatest in the pinelands. And that's if we're mainly focused on the, mainly the blue area that you see. So this is looking at percent change in mean wildfire severity between the no management scenario and the targeted management scenario. And so first we see that there is almost all, up to like, you know, 60 to 100% decrease in mean severity across the pinelands. Okay. Um, so management has a really, really huge impact on reducing wildfire severity across the landscape. So it's something to do with how much fire was burned. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. And so one thing to also think about here is, so the because of the continuous management, the continuous prescribed burning, um, they were, it kind of protected the hardwood cypress swamps. And so there were fewer fires. So we're not looking at the number of fires here, we're looking at fire severity. But there were fewer fires in the hardwood cypress swamps. But they occur, when they did occur, they occurred at higher severity because they were protected kind of for longer periods. And so it allowed for higher accumulated fuel loads. Um, and again, this is because it's kind of protected for um, a longer period. I thought that was a really sort of interesting result. Um, and here, this illustrates, uh, we're specifically looking at uh, fire management effects on the area burned. Um, and here you can see a, a big decrease in the cumulative area burned by wildfire over the entire simulation. So we're talking about over 100 years. And you can see differences between the contemporary fire weather and extreme fire weather, and then uh, the reduction um, in both of those um, due to landscape management. Okay, let's talk about carbon. <laughs> All right, management, uh, we found that management definitely increased carbon stability. So, all right, before we get into all that, one thing I want 
this is this is if I was in the class right now, I would say, okay, what's the first thing you see on this graph? What's the one thing that like sticks out to you? And um, and the first thing that sticks out to me is that there's a lot of growth potential. Like there's a lot of growth going on in these systems. And like, because otherwise, if it's a and and why would that be? And that's mainly because you know most of these areas are second growth forests. They have relatively young trees, right? They have a lot of growing to do themselves. So if we're able to, you know, maintain the overstory, they're gonna keep growing into the next hundred years, right? They're definitely gonna outgrow us, that's for sure. Um, and so there's a lot of growth potential and that happens in all the scenarios. So if you think about an area that has, you know, a lot more old growth and a more um, sort of variable age structure, then this curve might be a little flatter, all right? But anyways, that's why we see that big increase. Um, and another thing to think about is, so each year here, so the value for each year has to do with the mean, so the average value of above ground carbon for that, for the, for the landscape, okay? That includes the different wetlands and pinelands. Um, and then that is average, and then that's provided this value for each year. Um, and so it kind of smooths out any variability across the landscape. That's why it looks so smooth. So the biggest thing here to see is that um, that wildfires kind of had in the extreme fire weather on the right, wildfires had an immediate effect in above ground carbon. Um, as you can see, it kind of drops off there in, in panel B. Um, and, then, and then also there wasn't really a big effect between uh, the two management scenarios. So between D and F. And it's mainly because even though there's, a lot, there's harvesting incorporated into F, um, it's, it's only done at maybe like, I think it's like 2% of the landscape a year or 2% of the pinelands are harvested per year. Um, but the difference is that, that there's more variability um, in that uh, in that bottom graph in F, uh, which is really dependent on wildfire occurrence. Okay, so this is probably one of my my favorite um, one of my favorite graphs. Uh, so here we're looking at biomass. So before we kind of looked at the same similar graph, but it was on the severity. So this is management increase. So this is management increase compared to the no management scenario. And I just left the, um, the difference in ecoregions there so you can kind of take a look there. Um, but the biggest impact on increasing carbon, so percent change up to about 35% increase is in the intact uh, pineland where management effects are sort of most contiguous, where there's continuous surface fuels that are conducive to low intensity surface fires. Um, and, um, and again, there isn't a huge difference between the two different management scenarios that we that we implemented. So our main conclusions that we have for this uh, is that Extreme fire weather destabilizes above ground carbon stocks in what we would otherwise, you know, manage in pine stands, right? So if we're talking about, if we didn't manage it all, at all, then it really destabilizes above ground carbon. And of course, this is especially true, especially important, um, given, you know, climate change in the Southeast. Um, but when we're thinking about extreme fire weather, that there's a more pronounced effect for management for stabilizing above ground carbon during extreme fire weather than in contemporary fire conditions. And I think that makes it even more important for us to sort of, you know, push our fire management because it would re reduce even more wildfire size size of the largest wildfires and total area burned compared to how much it was reduced for the contemporary fire weather conditions. And given, get, and given that these large high severity wildfires homogenize the structure of the ecosystems, 
The provision of maintaining ecosystem services is contingent on building resilience to the most severe wildfires. And so this goes back to a question that we kind of had, like, is it worth harvesting? Um, or how does harvesting affect carbon stability? We found that the carbon stock stability was, was pretty similar between the two different management scenarios, whether we included harvesting or not. But there's, what we did find was that there's a potential for greater carbon loss due to additional harving, harvesting because we're actually taking carbon out of the system. But this is really dependent on the interaction of the amount of wildfires that actually occur on the landscape. And just some additional thoughts uh, for management that we've been kind of thinking about is um, and we, in, our, in our lab, we talk a lot about prescription burn windows um, and, uh, and you know, extreme further fire weather events. I mean, not surprisingly, narrow our prescription burn windows. But I think this actually further supports our need for adaptive capacity with using proactive management. And so this is another little self-citing I've got going on here. Um, but you know, applying prescribed fire now and continuously, you know, can maintain more carbon stocks. Run. So basically, you have pulses of near-term carbon loss from prescribed fire or some from harvest. You you typically will find that there's a long-term carbon gain associated with that. And this was just a schematic that we came up with in the paper. Um, but the idea is, is that if you have a climate change that it's affecting the ecosystem, it can affect it as much as that bottom red line. You know, with management, you can actually bend that carbon curve to maintain more stable carbon across your landscape. And some th thoughts for some next steps. Um, you know, we did not talk about the influences of the organic layer and fire, but it's something that we can dig into, into the model. So I wanna look more at the soil organic carbon loss, um, emissions, particularly looking at NEE, net ecosystem exchange, or net ecosystem carbon balance. Um, which is basically the net change through time of all the different components of carbon. So if we incorporate soil into tribal carbon and you know above ground carbon, emissions from fire, decomposition, leaching, all these different things, if we incorporate all that that we can get, you know, how much is actually being exchanged in the system and we can look at that flux. And also we want to incorporate uh, climate projections as they influence uh, plant physiology um, and even sort of soil water properties, um, changes in uh, soil respiration, and how, of course, that affects, you know, we often see when we've modeled other landscape, we see effects on regeneration or drought stress and uh, shifts in potentially community composition or reassembly of communities, you know, between different ecosystems, uh, which we haven't explored sort of fully um, in this project. So I just want to give a, a shout out to, um, to everybody that has helped us throughout this project. Of course, my co-PIs, uh, the Athens Fire Lab, um, I am always, you know, bouncing ideas and questions off them. Um, Salt Timbers Research Station, especially Kevin Hires, he was also a, um, an author on this paper. Um, and a special thanks to the Osceola National Forest and the Osceola Ranger District, um, especially from Shalanda, Jasper, and Ivan Green. Um, and I also want to say that um, we, we are working on, we're uh, with Rob Scheller and some amazing graduate students that he has. He's doing some, uh, we are actually, uh, simulating the entire Southern Appalachians right now. And we're gonna start publishing on this in the next couple months. So we're really excited about that project. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and I think that's it.
All right, Louise, thank you so much for your presentation. And if you guys joined us during the beginning of the webinar, uh, my name is David Godwin, and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange with the University of Florida. And that was a presentation from Dr. Louise Loudermilk, research ecologist with the US Forest Service Southern Research Station based in Athens, Georgia. Uh, we have time remaining in our uh, program today for questions uh, from the audience. And so if you have questions, please go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A tool in Zoom, uh, and we will try and go through those. If you are here seeking SAF CFE credit, uh, I've already put the uh, link in the chat window uh, to provide your information. So you can go ahead and do that now. So look for that in the chat window. So Louise, I'm gonna go, go open up the Q&A tool here and see what questions we've had come in. So Morgan says, have you been able to separate the effects on hardwood and cypress swamps based on the contiguous area? And then a follow-up question says, are there, are there differences between smaller isolated wetlands mm -hmm. and the larger swamp complexes? Uh, and uh, does, uh, prescribed fire burn through the smaller wetlands more consistently, says Morgan. Yeah, no, that's um, that's a great question. Um, I, I haven't specifically been able to separate that out, but I think it wouldn't be that hard to do. Um, I mean, we could almost look at those graphs a little more and kind of like pick it out a little bit. Uh, I would, I would, so my guess is that that they, they're probably more likely to get into the smaller wetlands because they dry out faster. Um, and, um, but probably they probably burn at less severity than they would potentially in the larger ones. Um, and, I, and I think we're probably seeing that in the model, right? If you see, if you remember the highest fire severity in that Northern part, um, and so, I, so I think that's what we're getting from there. Like I haven't actually um, done the, the calculations, but I think that's what I'm seeing, so. All right, thanks. Here's another question that came in uh, from Jana. Jana says, did you account for seasonality in your prescribed fire treatments? Many webinar or many wetlands or portions of larger wetlands have a history of fire. Uh, and increased fuel loads from what season prescribed fire create higher fuel loads and higher wildfire severity? Mm. Yeah, so, um, so the prescribed fire is not done seasonally in the model because of the scale that the model runs. Um, oh, it's like I see the questions come in and then it just changed to another question. Um, it's just nice to see. But anyway, um, but the, the fire weather that affects, um, sorry, I don't remember the entire question. If we were seasonality, no, we don't do seasons, okay? Because it's running a yearly time step. Um, but what was the other part of the question? So, so the question is, did you account for seasonality in the prescribed fire treatments because many wetlands or portions of larger wetlands have a history of fire increased fuel loads uh, mm -hmm. from wet season prescribed fire, uh, which then creates higher fuel loads and higher wildfire severity. Right, right. Yeah, I think I think it's sort of like, um, um, it's not explicit in the model, it's more implicit, right? So because of the scale that the model runs that, um, and based on the frequency distributions and stuff that we have, like I think it's already sort of incorporated into it. Um, and so it just doesn't do that sort of like fine scale um, mm -hmm. sort of seasonal changes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Alan. And Alan says, did your study distinguish between potential carbon losses from standing timber versus ground fuels uh, and vegetative growth from severe wildfire versus managed scenarios? Let's see, there's a lot in that, hold on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Standing timber versus ground fuels from severe wildfire versus managed scenarios. Okay, so I guess what he's talking about is if they're standing timber because that affects 
fire versus ground fuel. Yeah, so so yeah, so the different ways that the, the fuels are characterized, it does sort of it does represent those different like fuel categories, right? So so that is definitely represented um, from severe wildfire versus Yes, so the, so the fuel properties are kind of characterized the same between the different scenarios, if I'm answering that correctly. So I, if, if the folks in the audience have more questions, uh, you can go ahead and type them in now. Louise, I thought that it was interesting uh, that with increased fire saw in the, in the pinelands, you saw decreased fire frequency in, those, in the swamps. Uh, and then increased fire severity uh, in turn with that decreased right. fire frequency. Right. So right. Uh, what I was wondering was, have you had a chance to chat with the the folks from Osceola and, and get their feedback on that? You know, does, does that result make sense to the fire managers on the ground? Well, I'm curious to see if somebody responds, actually. I've been wanting to go down there and present these to them um, and see what they think. Because, I mean, it makes sense to me because you're going to have fire, higher fuel loads if you don't burn it for longer. You know, you're going to have deeper organic soils. Um, and so if there's longer drought periods and, I mean, it makes sense, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, but I would definitely love to hear their feedback. I haven't heard it yet. Here's, here's, yeah. Yeah, here's a question from Joe. Uh, yeah. Could you incorporate feedbacks between wildfire and pre prescribed fire? That is in areas where there is frequent fire, a wildfire bec becomes essentially another prescribed fire, which is a good, a good point. Uh, yeah, so, so basically I think this comes down to how the, fuels are char how, how the fuels are characterized in the model, right? So if an area, um, let's see, areas where there's a frequent fire, yeah, so, so so that's exactly what the model is doing, right? So when there's a frequent fire, but then a wildfire comes in to that area that's been frequently burned, mm -hmm. then it and it it basically turns into sort of a low severity fire. Yep. Right. Yep. So so yeah. It's it's kind of like the uh, the idea of of prescribed fire opening up opportunities for managed wildfires. Right, right. It's, again, it's not like explicit as like, okay, now we're going to use this wildfire as a prescribed fire. Like it doesn't really do that in the model, but but essentially it is representing that, yeah. Here's another uh, question that came in from Langford and, and Langford says that, that, uh, that they prescribe fire flatwoods every two to four years and exclude fire from their wetlands. Uh, could you offer your thoughts on what rotation uh, should they consider for, for the wetland environments? I'm assuming he's talking about fire rotation? Yeah, I think. I, um, whew, so. I don't know, that is not a question for me. <laughs> I, I'd rather ask uh, someone more experienced on burning wetlands, which I am not. So uh, if anybody in there has a recommendation, I'd love to hear it. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, partially we could probably, if you want a particular, I guess, so what is your purpose to do a wetland fire? Is it to reduce your, you know, uh, soil organic layer? Um, I mean, if, if, if that's the purpose, then you would probably burn more frequently, but maybe it won't be a wetland anymore. I don't know. So there's all these questions you kind of want to ask yourself before you start doing that. But yeah, if someone else is more experiential talking about that, then I'd love to hear it. We have a, a recorded webinar on our YouTube channel from about two years ago. And okay. uh, we had uh, a panel of speakers who were talking about uh, putting fire into wetlands. They were, um, okay. it was folks from the Ocala National Forest uh, yeah. in Central Florida. Yeah. And it was from their perspective and experience uh, in, in getting fire into these um, uh, isolated wet, wetlands that, that, that were nestled within um, longleaf pine and, and I guess in some cases uh, around the scrub areas in the Ucala National Forest. Mm -hmm. But um, definitely uh, something, it's, it's not necessarily flatwoods as much, uh, but it's definitely right. a, a uh, resource that that might provide some guidance. So, did they say anything about rotation 
about Hall uh, and they're burning it? Maybe you don't. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. I don't remember <laughs> off the top of my head. So yeah, I would okay. go check that out and, and see. And, and certainly, you know, we had a question from uh, Jana that came in earlier. I know she uh, has a lot of experience in, in restoring and putting fire into wetlands up in the uh, panhandle of Florida in the Apalachicola National Forest and, and areas okay. up here. Um, and so, you know, it's certainly it's, it's location dependent and, and not all wetlands are the same. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I know, I know there's also talk about like hardwood encroachment into different wetlands and they want to burn it because of that. And yeah, so there's all kinds of different reasons to burn or not burn in the wetlands, so yeah. We have some more questions that have come in. Here's one from Chris. Uh, Chris asks, were the effects of post-harvest slash measurable with regards to wildfire severity and carbon loss? Oh, that's a good question. Post-harvest slash. Um, yes. I'd have to look into the paper specifically, um, but yes, I know that was incorporated in as a um, as sort of a fuel characteristic um, in you know response from the harvesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a good uh, lead in to, here's a question from Jesse. Hey, Jesse. Uh, and Jesse says, hey, I, I haven't used Landis. Uh, could, hey, Jesse. <laughs> yeah, could, could, it's like a UF reunion. I know, uh, right? <laughs> good eaters. Could mastication uh, type of treatments be incorporated into model scenarios? And that's a good one. Abs yeah, absolutely. Definitely. It's been used many times. Absolutely. Yep. So did... Um, was was mastication a part of any of the scenario, scenarios that y'all ran? Uh, in this um, again, this is a detail I'm not entirely sure. Um, yeah, I I don't know the answer. <laughs> we can go read the paper, <laughs> or we can ask uh, ask Dan. Thanks, All right. Jesse. All right. Well, it looks like we've gotten been able to get through most uh, all the questions at this point. Uh, anybody else? Oh, here comes another from Jana. Uh, Jana says, I would suggest that while not all wetlands are created equal, wetlands should also be considered a fire adapted community. Absolutely. With several species dependent on regularly burned wetlands that require active management to manage fire severity. Great comment. I, I think we would both agree. Yeah, thank you. For sure. And Thank it, you for the comment. Mm -hmm. And certainly because uh, fire has been excluded for many reasons uh, from wetlands across uh, mm -hmm. many of these fire dependent uh, landscapes, that, that's, yeah. that's why so many of our threatened and endangered species uh, are associated with these isolated wetlands mm -hmm. that haven't, uh, haven't had frequent fire. And here's another from Tim. Uh, most of our longleaf restoration is on old loblolly plantations where fire has been excluded for some time. As such, the wetland edges have expanded into the upland. Mm -hmm. mm. Gum and water oak, he mentions. We have yeah. encouraged fire movement into these wetlands under favorable conditions to create more defined edges over time, he says. Sure. Mm -hmm. Normally every two years in the pine and then every other fire uh, in the wetlands. Hmm. Great, great feedback there. Thanks, Tim. Okay. So there, it almost looks like he's trying to fight the encroachment of the wetland, right? I think it's the, uh, it's, it's the, the march of music species up out of the wetlands into the uplands. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And that's interesting, huh? Like we get with uh, sweet gum and in and some cases, yep. you know, like loblolly, things like that, mm -hmm. moving their way up. Uh, sweet gum Low. can live in like anything. <laughs> <laughs> Joe O'Brien says it's the tree of the future. Yeah, that's right. All right. Uh, well, Louise, thank you so much. Uh, we're getting to the top of the hour. Let's see. Uh, we have one a comment here. Let's hit this from Brian. Uh, Brian says some forestry companies, this is in the chat. Some forestry companies are leaving forest slash on contour to help soil and water on the landscape. Could keeping the soil moisture higher, the trees less drought stressed help prevent wildfire? 
he mentions beaver biomimicry contour forestry may also help convert a flooding liability into forestry assets and groundwater recharge enhancement. Huh. Yeah, there's a lot in that. There, um, yeah. So basically he's asking if he leaves some coarser debris down to maintain soil moisture. Yes. Yep. I don't know, because you're also add, adding fuels, so I'm not sure, even though, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> it's interesting, though. Yep. He, I, I think that's also like a decomposition question, you know, things like that. So mm -hmm. you have to have a lot. You have to have a lot. I mean, you're talking about that's very localized, I think, you know, in terms of like soil moisture. Unless oh, it's like masticated fuels or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, if you would like to follow up with Louise, uh, we have her email address on the screen right now. Uh, if you would like to reach out about some of the publications uh, that she mentioned today or have additional questions uh, that you would like to uh, follow up. So with that, Louise, thank you so much for your presentation. It was great to have you on today and uh, for sharing your work and your team and the folks uh, that you guys worked with at the Osceola National Forest. And thanks everybody for joining us online today. And we hope that this webinar will be useful in your fire management programs and have a good afternoon. All right, thanks everybody.